On day five of COVID, I bled like no other. Sometimes my cycle would last three weeks, four weeks. I started seeing increase in regular bleeding, sometimes heavy. It was almost like I was hemorrhaging um, for eight days straight. And the heaviest bleeding. After the COVID infection, also noted after the vaccine. I started thinking about uh, possible risks associated for erectile function uh, and uh, polymetry. I have sexual issues. I'm Morgana. I'm a humanitarian photographer and filmmaker. And this is my husband, Yaku. He's a helicopter pilot. In 2014, we were living in Liberia, West Africa, when the world's largest Ebola outbreak erupted. I helped PCI Media share Ebola survivor stories through radio, TV, and social media reaching nearly 10 million people. It helped curb the spread of the virus by driving changes in attitudes and behaviors. I saw the impact the storytelling had on communities in the middle of the outbreak. So when COVID-19 started spreading where we lived in 2020, we began documenting and sharing stories of COVID-19 survivors in New York to spread awareness about the disease. But we decided that wasn't enough. We wanted to show how COVID-19 is impacting people across America. So we moved out of our New York apartment and we moved into a 19-foot trailer so we could document COVID-19 survivors in all 50 states in America. Another set of mysterious symptoms that have emerged with COVID-19 survivors are changes in their reproductive and sexual health. Today, we are in Tacoma, Washington to meet with Tammy and her husband, Brian, who both caught the virus at the beginning of the pandemic in April of 2020. After a couple months, they thought the worst was over, but then they started developing new symptoms. The big thing for me too is I keep hearing the survival rate is this, the survival rate is that. And I can't tell you how many times I have to tell people, it's not about the survival rate, it's the recovery rate. The recovery rate is huge for people. I mean, God bless you if you got it for two weeks and you're done. But look out because it can come back and sneak up on you like it did with me. And here I am 10 months out still struggling with some lingering symptoms. So my first initial illness, I was, was like two weeks and then I started to get better. And then I would say between the second month and the fifth to sixth month is when all the weird symptoms started happening. October of 2019, I, my period just stopped. And I didn't have a period for several months and it was like, oh, okay, yay. <laughs> As a woman, you know, you're, you're looking, this is the, that time frame of, of you know, perimenopause. So um, October 2019, I stopped having my menstrual cycle. And then on day five of COVID, so it was April 10th, I bled like no other. It was almost like I was hemorrhaging um, for eight days straight. And I let my doctors know, and they of course didn't want to go down that rabbit hole of it being COVID. Um, but now we see that there are so many people, women, that are coming online and asking, are you having heavier periods? How many of you that are in menopause have started bleeding again? And there's quite a few. So something's going on there. Katie also caught COVID in the first wave of the pandemic while living in New York. But eventually she had to move home to Wenatchee, Washington because her long COVID symptoms were so severe she could no longer support herself. When I was having my menstrual cycle after long COVID, it, it was like a monster, a demon was living inside of my body. Sometimes my cycle would last three weeks, four weeks, um, and the heaviest bleeding, it was just like, I could not go anywhere because I had to make sure that I could take care of myself. And the pain that I felt is something, pain that I have never felt before. And it lasted 
for the whole duration. I really only got like a week off and then it would start again. Um, so there was always some sort of cramping and cramping in my back, um, headaches, more dizziness, um, having issues because of losing too much blood. Mentally, I was just a wreck. I, I didn't know which side was sunny and which side was night. Like, it was just, um, I imagine I was really hard to put up with. Um, my mood was all over the place. My depression was so much worse than it is now, and it's still a battle. So, um, yeah, I, I can't imagine trying to go back um, and live in that body again. I couldn't find any detailed studies on the impact of the COVID-19 virus on women's reproductive systems. But I did find out that Johns Hopkins is one of five institutions selected by the National Institute of Health to conduct research on potential impacts of the COVID-19 vaccines on menstruation. Dr. Borge is the principal investigator on this study and the director of gynecology and obstetrics. With the pandemic and uh, starting December 2020, when we started having the vaccination, I started seeing increase in regular bleeding, sometimes heavy, in some of the patients after the COVID infection. Also noted after the vaccine, even some women who have been menopausal for some time, it was uh, very minimal bleeding that happened after uh, menopause also after they received the vaccine. And it got to the point for me where my doctor, when she returned back from leave, she wanted me to get an ultrasound and follow up on why that happened. So I went and did the, um, the ultrasound and got the scans and had some blood work done. And my blood work was that of like an 80 year old woman that's been on, had menopause. And you know, I'm only 51 at the time. So she said, something's going on. And then the ultrasound revealed that my um, uterine wall had thickened um, to eight millimeters. When in October, when I had a surgery, um, emergency appendectomy, they were able to compare and it was only about two millimeters at that time. So something happened when I got COVID that, that made me bleed. They weren't sure if it was COVID or if it was, you know, uh, ovarian cancer or, um, so I opted to go ahead and just get a total hysterectomy rather than having to go back every six months and have them you know, get a sample to see if there's any um, cancer cells. I have my girls, you know, they're adult women now, and um, that's why I didn't hesitate to just have them take it. I can't imagine being 20 years old and having to go through something like this when you haven't had a family uh, or started a family. I started with my just PCP, and then he referred me to a gynecologist and was able to do like a full exam where I, I didn't have endometriosis or some of the other um, conditions that can cause this kind of pain. They said that I had extra inflammation, lots of extra inflammation in my body and uh, it was in my uterus as well, but it wasn't an unusual amount. Like I didn't have any extra cysts. They, there wasn't a physical reason, and that's what kind of stumped them all. And the, the doctors weren't able to say if it was connected to COVID or not. However, I didn't have any problems before that. I was in so much pain that I would have literally given any organ to feel better. And it just happened to be the one that was causing me the most grief and, and ended up healing me. So I just said, Let's pull the plug and take it out. How did things change after that surgery? First of all, I wasn't experiencing this horrible pain, this just exquisite pain um, every month for multiple weeks at a time. So my body was able to do the healing that it was trying to do. So I was able to progress more in PT. I could concentrate more at um, my memory therapy. I could dive a little bit deeper with my therapist. So all these things that I was really digging and really trying to do, 
I hadn't even scratched the surface because I was in too much pain. And, and after I healed, I was just able to really dig my heels in and uh, concentrate on something other than the pain. That pain anyway. <laughs> that was the best thing I've ever done is have my hysterectomy. I had a lot of people tell me that it was a huge mistake and I am so glad I didn't listen to them because all of the progress that I have made is after I had that surgery. I am so, again, grateful that I had the hysterectomy. Let's talk about the study. So you've re you last year received a grant from NIH to study the impact of the COVID vaccines on menstruation. Would you give us an overview of that study? My group work is focused on uh, answering these um, three questions. The first question is, if there is any association between uh, the COVID vaccine and uh, abnormalities in menstruation in women. Second question is, if there is association, what's this, the nature of it? And the third, if there is association, uh, what's causing it? I'm so interested to hear the results. Can you tell us a little bit more about the results? So from the um, initial preliminary data analysis that we have done, it seems like there is some association between the vaccine and some menstrual regularity in some of the participants here, which actually is somewhat similar to our observation in the clinic, which was anecdotal. There is some menstrual irregularity that happened during the month that the um, participant or the user um, received the vaccine. So sometimes the period was um, came later or earlier than uh, expected, or the bleeding days was uh, shorter or longer. What we have seen so far is it can go both ways. The vast majority it went back to normal after one month, very few that it persists more than uh, this. And I, I would like to stress that this is in the uh, minority of women who had changes. So when you look at the data that we have, the vast majority of uh, the women who received the vaccine did not have any um, change. So it's a, it's a small fraction. But then when you talk to certain people, and they're probably in the severe minority, there are some who have just had really extreme cases. Is that just a complete anomaly? Or is it just not documented enough? We, we always look at the data uh, from a statistical uh, point of view. And if you look at the what we call a distribution curve, um, there is always um, majority of the population and then as you go toward the extremes the number gets smaller and smaller and if you um, try to do um, a study you might not see these numbers because you will not study every one you study a sample and the sample might not catch something that's um, it happens one in a million for example we see some cases that were um, um, more than two or three months and um, I can expect or suspect that some women maybe very few maybe we're talking about extremely few would have extreme cases even though we, we don't see them on the studies that we do but I can imagine that they are present in the community and from a scientific standpoint it's possible and I think it's just the extreme tales of our distribution. What's your theory as to what may cause the changes in their cycles? Our theory is the COVID vaccine and possibly the infection itself affect the immune cells in the body. And because the, uh, there are so many immune cells in the inner lining of the uterus, and many of these immune cells secrete lots of proteins and other uh, mediators that regulate uh, the shedding of the inner lining of the uterus, which is actually menstruation and the bleeding and the mechanism that stops the bleeding. So uh, it's reasonable to hypothesize that changes in the immune um, response, whether to the infection or the um, vaccine, can affect the function of the inner lining of the uterus and therefore um, can affect the menstruation. But one of the interesting things that has been getting our attention. Women get infection by many other viruses. 
and these other viruses also cause immune response and it's not common that we observe abnormal bleeding uh, or effect of menstruation after these other infection or the vaccination so women receive lots of vaccination we we don't frequently or, or barely we don't see effect we're very curious to uh, figure out why this happened and what we're trying to do is we're trying to get both uh, increase the public awareness of the importance of research um, focused on uh, women health and reproductive health and also to increase the funding uh, from the NIH and other uh, funding uh, organizations because without a rigorous uh, research we will not be able to uh, to answer um, these questions so uh, my answer to you is that we're, we're just starting to to learn Far fewer men share their experiences, but there have been a number of reports of men around the world experiencing sexual health challenges following COVID infection. Dr. Sansone in Rome, Italy, has been researching COVID's impact on men's reproductive and sexual health for the last two years. I've been studying uh, sexual health uh, since, uh, as I told before, since more or less the last 15 years or so since 2007. So my research has been focused on this, uh, on the risk factors for sexual dysfunction, uh, on the possible psychological and medical risk factors associated. Uh, and then uh, when COVID-19 started, uh, I was uh, just looking at uh, the news articles that were published uh, and a few of these uh, caught my attention. So the first articles that were stating that uh, COVID-19 was uh, largely due to endothelial dysfunction. Endothelial dysfunction means that the vessels, including the penile vessels, are not able to stretch, meaning that uh, there is a, a reduced inflow of blood in the penis in this case. So once I uh, had this idea that it was possible that the same endothelial function that was causing uh, problems in the lungs could also have problems uh, in the penis, started thinking about uh, uh, the possible risks uh, associated for erectile function uh, and uh, polynecty. Tammy's husband, Brian, was hospitalized, ventilated, given plasma, and remdesivir after his initial COVID infection in April 2020. But some unexpected symptoms began after he came home from the hospital. Have you had any other lingering symptoms or side effects or anything like that? Yeah, I have. <laughs> um, I have sexual issues. It's hard to talk about, but yes. Before I went in, I was taking testosterone. Then I went and saw a doctor after I got out and he said, I don't need it. He just blew it off like it was nothing. So I went two months without it. My energy level was way down, no sex drive, nothing. And I went and saw a doctor that, that Tammy's seen. She immediately sent me in for a blood panel. And when that blood panel came back, my testosterone level was at 60. And I believe the normal level is uh, 200 to 600 or something like that. So she immediately prescribed me my testosterone. So I'm back on that. That helps. I don't know if it's due to COVID. Before that, I never had any issues. Now I have, now I, I don't, I don't urinate the same way. I don't have the same intensity of orgasms. They don't feel complete, whole. It's upsetting in a way. That it, it's, you know, you you want something, you want that, and it, you want it to feel good. And when you can't complete it, it don't feel good. And I honestly think that has everything to do with COVID. I thank that for it. Another thing that I had to start doing after COVID is taking Viagra. And that's, there's no shame in that as well. 
I mean, if you have to do it, you might as well do it. Thank you so much for talking about this. It's hard. It's very hard. <laughs> it's very hard, but you're not the only one. You know, for, for all of those other ones, they're not alone. I'm, I'm sure thousands of other people have it. Don't be ashamed. I was nervous to talk about it, but I was like, you know what, I'm gonna. It takes a lot off your shoulders if you just talk about it. I can't thank you enough for sharing your story and your experience, and I think it will be invaluable for people. Well, thank you for giving me the opportunity to share it. And I just want to let everybody out there know, you're not alone. So I read your art, well, I read one of your research articles and I loved how you outlined there's multiple reasons why COVID could possibly cause erectile dysfunction in men. Would you list those for us? Uh, so of course, the first uh, and clearest one, I guess, uh, is what happens uh, from a psychological point of view, meaning that if you think about it, uh, if you are a COVID-19 patient, uh, at least in the first part of the COVID-19 uh, pandemic, uh, you were isolated, people were scared of you, were scared of them being close to you, and so on. Uh, so uh, the isolation and whatever came together with isolation was uh, a great cause of uh, uh, psychological distress. On top of that, uh, even just the uh, economical situation associated with this, so people that were uh, laid off their jobs uh, or uh, people that were unable to go uh, see their parents and so on, this also had a heavy psychological burden. Uh, but of course, this is also highly relevant for sexual health. As I said before, there is bacterial dysfunction, meaning that in fact, uh, people usually have this, this, difficult, this difficulty in uh, stretching the uh, uh, vessels in the penis, so reduced oxygen uh, to the penis means that the, the erection itself is reduced or impaired. We also have uh, some new data on the possible association with testosterone. Uh, testosterone is the main uh, uh, hormone involved in uh, sexual function. Uh, we know that uh, the testis is a vulnerable uh, organ for COVID-19. So in the end, uh, there is a chance that uh, people who might develop uh, COVID-19 might also develop what we would call a subclinical hypogonadism, meaning that the testic the testis is still working, but uh, it is uh, uh, more uh, stressed to me. So it is uh, less reactive, uh, it requires more energy to produce testosterone, and in the end, this also means that these subjects, uh, uh, as I said before, developing uh, uh, hypogonadism, also develop all the consequences of hypogonadism itself, meaning erectile dysfunction, increased inflammatory status, and once again, even uh, uh, less uh, response to psychological distress. On top of that, we can also say that uh, if we have uh, less oxygen in our lungs, it will become more difficult to have a, a physical exercise for sexual function. There are, uh, on top of that, as you see, there are so many possible associations. So the drugs that are also involved with uh, treating, uh, as you know, many people develop a persistent uh, vascular dysfunction following COVID-19. So these patients might need to have a, a lifelong treatment with other drugs that can also have negative effects on sexual function. It's uh, never ending, I would say. It's hard to know how many people this is affecting. There's a lack of studies, and it's a sensitive topic that not everyone feels comfortable talking about. We have a lot more to learn. But anecdotally, at least, it does seem that COVID is affecting people's reproductive and sexual health more so than other viruses. And that alone begs the question, why? And calls for deeper study.